There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Well, hello, BookTube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel and welcome back to another Friday Reads. So I have a story for you. This is an issue that was starting to percolate that I didn't want to talk about in last Friday Reads. And I want to talk, tell you all about it now. I made a very quick reference to the fact that I'm not vaccinated yet. And the numbers of daily coronavirus diagnoses is skyrocketing in Tokyo. I remember at the beginning of the pandemic... People would panic when it was more than 500 people a day within the lesser city of Tokyo, not greater metropolitan Tokyo, but lesser Tokyo, which is still about 16 million people or something. And it, if it got over 500 a day, that's when the government started thinking about doing their soft lockdown, which we call a state of emergency, and so on and so on. And so the, I would get nervous when it would go over 500. Well, people don't get nervous, haven't been nervous about the number going over 500 for quite some time, but I think the highest it ever got on our third wave earlier, I don't know when that was, this spring or something, was when it got up to 2,000 a day. That was when people went into full-scale panic mode. Well, for the last week, it has been most days 4,000 or above, and yesterday it hit 5,000. Half of the infections are the new Delta one, the one that's so much more contagious, and here I am. An aging white guy with lots of, um, what, what do they call them, complications, like things that make it, it would be quite, quite serious if I got coronavirus. So I decided on the weekend to contact all of my bosses and say, look, this is the situation. You can fire me or you can put all of the classes I teach for you back on Zoom because I am not leaving the apartment until I'm fully vaccinated lovely people that they are they said of course we'll go back to zoom or something similar some online arrangement and that took effect immediately so i've hardly been out of the house since the weekend then there was the very difficult issue of trying to get vaccinations booked appointments kenji had to has to do it all and because i can't speak enough good enough japanese and you're supposed to get it within your city my city is nakano and he would phone and they'd say please don't call us again we have nothing available in and won't have any new availability until August 15th. Call back then. So there was nothing to do but wait. Um, I go to a university hospital where there's a, a great English language. Most, almost all of the doctors and nurses and stuff speak English, so it's a great place for me to go for a variety of medical issues. Nothing that you need to worry about or that I really want to talk about here. So I asked one of my doctors when I was there about six weeks ago, I said, can I get vaccinated here? And he said, where do you live? And I told him, he said, no, we're only able to offer vaccinations to people that live in the neighborhood around the university hospital, but maybe that will change in the later, check back. So I had to go yesterday to get just a blood test. Then I had to see a, a different doctor. So when I went for the blood test, I asked the receptionist at that particular clinic, I knew she could speak quite a, quite a fair amount of English. I said, do, do, are there any vaccinations for coronavirus available here? She said, no. Okay, so I went and sat down waiting to get called in for my blood test. And she came over to me about a minute later and said, well, actually, we do offer vaccinations here, but we were fully booked, but I just got a cancellation. Can you come in two weeks for your first one? Pfizer one, the best one, the one with the least amount of side effects. And then three weeks after that or whatever, a month later for your second shot. And I said, yes. She said, well, you can't cancel. I said, I'm not going to cancel. <laughs> I told her I loved her. So ah, I'm so glad that that's now booked. So I will stay home from the classroom, but continue to work from home until the end of September go back to the classroom in the first week of October and I hate the summer in Tokyo it's so hot it's so sticky it's so humid it's horrible so my summer is over I don't have to leave the house again until October except to go buy alcohol or that lesser um, need that I sometimes have food <laughs> I am sitting here with the air conditioner blowing on me, it is at 20 degrees, and it has been on 20 degrees 24 hours a day for 
a couple months and will stay like that until maybe November and I don't have to go out in that heat. Ah ha ha. So yesterday was a very, very good day. I'm gonna try an experiment for the next few Fridays. I'm gonna do just a very quick, like hopefully 60 seconds or less, a recap of some of the highlights of the videos I've posted since the prior Friday reads in a hope of enticing a, a handful more of you to uh, check out some of the content that I post other than Friday reads. So here is my debut little recap thingy. How did you get to become a Yiddish translator? So uh, it all goes back to my childhood. I grew up in a very word oriented family. We had a shelf of dictionaries right in the dining room and it was very rare for us to get through a meal without consulting at least one of them. And years ago, uh, my mother died fairly young, and I decided that I would study Yiddish as a memorial to her. Most schlocky, horrifically, puke-worthily sentimental works of literary fiction that I've ever uh, read half of. Oh, it was awful. I was started to fantasize about the little girl's death because I just hated the uh, sentimentality of that. Because the premise from the start, the book talks about an aunt that goes into like a woman's head <laughs> and I was like that is very interesting because at first I thought it was gonna be wild crazy sort of fast paced and then it slowed down you realize it's very very slow and very meditative and this so I had a great reading week too I finished five books I have no bales and I've started a bunch so let's get started this is a collection of short stories by Yenta Mash on the landing, translated from the Yiddish by Ellen Cassidy. I did an interview with her, so this was one of my secret reading projects, and we talked about this book, another book she's translated, and uh, Yiddish women writers in English translation, so that was my little secret project for Women in Translation Month. There's a link in the show notes. I love this. It was a five-star read. I talk about it quite a bit in my chat with Ellen Cassidy, and I recommend it very highly. Yenta Mash, who died in Israel in 2013, I think she was about 80 maybe, 90 I think. She had been born in Soviet Moldova, and then she was with, along with all the Jewish people and other people in her neighborhood. The Russians, the Soviets, they exiled them all to Siberia, and then she came back, and then she ended up in Israel. She'd led her a life marred by tragedy, but her perspective on all that in these stories, which is very autobiographical, um, mixes humor and courage and pathos uh, in a way that, as tough as some of the th events in the stories are, it's an absolute joy to read. And you will f find Ellen Cassidy an absolutely delightful person to listen to. I can't wait to have her back. A couple weeks ago, I told you that uh, Joe Smith and I had started this buddy read of these Indonesian short stories by Primodia Ananta Tor. This is, there's a glare on this. Independence Day and other stories. And I told you that I absolutely hated the first story, which was 50 pages of the 100 page little book. And so I thought about bailing, but I'm glad that we didn't. The second story was about half that length, and it depicted a horrific situation of a child bride in the neighborhood. I think she was eight years old when she was got, uh, in, forced into an arranged marriage. It was just horrific, and really a story that had a light touch and a, a lot of nuance to it that what I thought was completely missing from the longer title story. So we were glad we didn't bail, and then we went last week to the third story, which was kind of in between the two. It was about a boy's circumcision, and it had a lot of interesting detail in it, but I didn't think really worked as a short story. But the, the middle story called Inem, it's worth worth this picking up this little booklet published by paper and ink just to read the middle story and you know I think a lot of people would like some of the other stories better than I did oh and I should say now that I've kind of bashed the translation that this is translated from the Indonesian by Willem Samuels also known as John H. McGlynn and I read a book that he translated under his real name earlier this year Yesterday, when I was at the hospital, I had my earphones in all the way on the train there, double-masked. There was a cute boy sitting beside me on the train, and I was so busy looking over at how cute he was, and then I realized he's not wearing a fucking mask! I haven't seen that. Well, I haven't been riding the train, but that's the first time I've seen anybody on public transportation without a mask for more than a year. 
And I was sitting right beside him. Uh, I was double masked, so I think, I think I was probably fine. But what the hell? Anyway, I was listening to, and in fact, because it was such a long day, it was about a half day, getting to the hospital, being at the hospital, coming back, that I had my earphones on the whole time, and I finished Women in White by Wilkie Collins. I loved it. I gave it five stars, even though the detective kind of plot that those... Is that a trope? No, it's not a trope. The, the, all this stuff around detective stories, I didn't really care for that, and I kind of stopped paying attention to the intricacies of how the mystery was solved. But it was a really fantastic novel, and it was really well done, narrated on the free audiobook thing, LibriVox. It, with multiple narrators, the main narrator, the one with the great British accent, um, who has passed away since the, he volunteered to do many of the chapters and I didn't follow along with the free ebook I most of the time I just listened it was easy to just listen and I got everything I think I'm glad I read it I don't think I have much else to say about it I studied one or two of his novels as a undergrad and hadn't ever thought to pick any of them up because I remembered this kind of melodramatic plot but no this one it did work it was a very shapely literary novel I will read more. I think the other famous one by him that I have not read is The Moonstone. I only have read, I think, oh, I, wrote, I did read two, and they are lesser known ones. In university, I studied Armadale and Basil, those two. That's my first time listening to an audio, one of those free, volunteer-based, public domain audiobooks, and uh, it went well. I will have a little bit more to say about audiobooks later in this broadcast, here in this later in this Friday read, so stay tuned for that. I'm not going to say too much because I absolutely feel that it's incumbent upon me to do a full review because I ended up loving this book and nobody else I know liked it. The Recent East, a debut novel by the American writer Thomas Grattan. He is a gay writer. This is his debut. He, one of the main characters is queer. It's about a neurotic family where the mother, when she was a child, with her parents, they escaped from East Germany. They defected to West Germany and they ended up in America. And then much later, after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of her marriage, she gets word that the house that had been in the family for generations is available to her if she wants to cl claim it. And so she uproots herself and her teenage children and goes to what had the former East Germany, and it t uh, takes over the house, but then has a kind of a mental breakdown. So there is just such weirdness to this story that a lot of people, anybody that I've heard about, who's left a comment before, or I've been watching on Goodreads, didn't like it, gave it two stars, gave it three stars. Um, it was a five-star read for me because I thought he made those very unusual, quirky, many of them v deeply wounded and d really over-the-top neurotic characters. He made them, he really care about them. They were just, they just jumped off the page. I think this is an incredible novel that w isn't everyone's cup of tea. So I am setting a challenge for myself to t do a full review to convince some of you that you should give it a try. The writing is fantastic. It's certainly for a debut. It's a seven star read. Less successful, alas, was this queer novel from China, Mu Kao's In the Face of Death We Are Equal, translated from the Chinese by Scott E. Myers. I didn't really like it. I stuck with it to the bitter end because if I just looked at it as a bunch of anecdotes or a bunch of stories about the lives of working class queer men in China in the fairly modern times, um, somewhat modern times, uh, it was interesting on that level but it didn't have any shapeliness to it. It was uh, uh, by turns overly grotesque or overly melodramatic with way too many characters and all of them seemed to have the first name Little. So they had Little Jade and Little little Him and Little Him number two and, and the names were all, you know, it was really hard to keep track and about halfway through I stopped trying to keep track and just kind of followed as much of the story as I could. I admit to doing a fair amount of skimming to finish it it didn't work for me. Um, if you're not as fussy about kind of literary quality, I have inadvertently insulted this translator before, so I don't think that this is a translation issue. 
I've read one other book by him that I really liked and I made a comment and he found my video and I'm sorry about that but this one didn't this one was less successful than than the other one I read that he translated I don't think it's the translator's fault this just was not a Sean book those of you who have different literary tastes than mine please check it out it's it, it didn't bore me ever but I didn't really like it so that's what I finished I have started a bunch my goodness the first one is for Women in Translation Month, Women Dreaming by Salma, translated from the Tamil by Mina Kandasamy. It's set in a Tamil village, and it's the lives, and apparently eventually the dreams, of the women in that village, and it is intricately plotted already. I've only read 30 pages, and I want to call for every book that ever gets published to have a cast of characters or dramatis personae, however you pronounce that, in the front, because even though there aren't that many characters listed here, it's just invaluable, and I don't know why every novel doesn't do it. Is it just my Twitter-fied brain that I have really tr trouble following stories that have a lot of characters? That's why reading ebooks is so much so superior, because I can just search for them so quickly, but uh, this would solve a lot of my readerly problems. Their village lives in, I don't know when, what era it's set in, it doesn't read very modern, but there's talk about abortion and contraception, so it can't be like 19th century, I guess, but I, I don't know when in the 20th or 21st century, I have no idea, but boy, their lives are just pinned down with misogyny. Oh my god, it's really tough going to read about how oppressed they are. And there is a fight, there is an oomph, and a resistance, and a courage that I can already see in the, in the characters. So it's going to be really interesting to, to continue. Starting out, good. It's now time for Sean the Book Maniac to be talking about No One Is Talking About This by Patricia Lockwood, but I have no idea what to say. I'm not very far in, about 30 pages, so you can see I, I focused on finishing stuff up rather than making too much headway with my new books. I love the writing. I haven't read anything else by Lockwood, but I wasn't expecting it to be so funny. It's not only funny, but there are some really funny bits. And it's about a woman. If there is a story that's going to have a through line to the end, it seems to be about a woman who is addicted to Twitter. And all of her life is online, and she has trouble kind of keeping tabs on her non-Twitter life. I think that's the story. But it may just be kind of an essayistic romp with all these topics. I don't know how much of a th narrative through line there will end up being. I don't want you to tell me in the comments. I want to find out for myself. But the writing is I'm very impressed with, and the humor is hitting me just right. Yeah, let me read. This is one of the funniest things I've read in, in so far. Our mothers could not stop using horny emojis. They used the winking one with its tongue out on our birthdays. They sent us long rows of the spurting three droplets when it rained. We had told them a thousand times, but they never listened. As long as they lived and loved us, as long as they had split themselves open to have us, they would send us the peach in peach season. Never send me the eggplant again, Mum. she texted. I don't care what you're cooking for dinner. <laughs> we'll see. I never thought about the sexual connotations of the of the rain emoji. I've never used it for any in, in any context. I have to think about that. That's for the Booker Long List and also Sanjeev Sahota's China Room, and I was really hep to start it and I'm really enjoying it. I'd say the first chapter just blew me out of the water and now I'm thirty-two pages in and I'm not really sure about the backstory that we're getting to, but I'm not hating it it's just not grabbing me the way the first couple chapters that were set in the uh, present of the story so this is punjab 1929 and three young brides i think they're all about 15 have been married in one big wedding to three brothers of this family and that their parents had promised them to when they were all about five years old oh boy this is a theme of theme of the week for my reading holy smokes and they are, have not been told which of the three brothers, because it was one big wedding ceremony, is their husband. And when it's time for them to fuck, the, their mother-in-law very sternly tells them to go into the certain room. I think it's the mating room. I shouldn't keep saying fuck, should I? Um, and it's dark, and they don't see which of the 
brothers comes in to lay on top of them. So they have no idea, and they're trying to catch the voice, because there's a little bit of conversation during that mating session. And it's, it's a horrific situation. It's very compelling, and uh, I don't know... I don't have anything else to say about it. And I loved his The Year of the Runaways. It's one of the best British novels from from the 21st century. And he's a tremendous writer. Didn't like his debut. Pretty much hated it. Loved The Year of the Runaways. I hope that this will continue to be great. And I have started Catch the Rabbit by Lana Bastashich. And she translated it from the Bosnian herself. And oh my god. Um, I don't think I'm going to say a darn thing. I haven't checked in with Ronan Hessian, my buddy reader. We're going to check in on, I think, the first 90 or 100 pages on Sunday. But this is the first book I think I've ever read that was translated by its author. It's about a really kind of screwed up friendship between two Bosnian women from their, I don't know if it started from their teenage years, but from their childhoods. And now they are not, no longer children. And the, the narrator here is in Ireland with a, her living Irish boyfriend. And she has not heard from this old friend that was really kind of, that was really kind of destructive, controlling relationship. And let me just read you the first page and a half. This is translated by the author. To start from the beginning, you have someone and then you don't. And that's the whole story. Except you would say you can't have a person. Or should I say she. Perhaps that's better. You'd like that, to be a she in a book. All right then. She would say you can't have a person, and she would be wrong. You can own people for embarrassingly little. Only she likes to think of herself as the general rule for the workings of the whole cosmos. And the truth is, you can have someone, just not her. You can't have Layla. Unless you finish her off, put her in a nice frame, and hang her on the wall. Although, is it really still us once we stop? Once we freeze for the picture? One thing I know for sure, stopping and Layla never went together well. That's why she is a blur in every single photograph. She could never stop. Even now, within this text, I can almost feel her fidget. If she could, she would sneak between two sentences like a moth between two slats of a Venetian blind and would finish my story off from the inside. She would change into the sparkly rags she always liked, lengthen her legs, enhance her breasts, add some waves to her hair. Me, she would disfigure, leaving a single lock of hair on my square head. She would give me a speech impediment, make my left leg limp, think up an inherent deformity so I keep dropping the pencil. Perhaps she would take it one step further. She is capable of such villainy. She wouldn't even mention me at all turn me into an unfinished sketch. You would do that, wouldn't you? Sorry, she. She would do that if she were here. But I am the one telling the story. I can do whatever I want with her. She can't do anything. She is three hits on the keyboard. I could throw the laptop into the mute Viennese Danube tonight and she would be gone. Her fragile pixels would bleed into the cold water and empty everything she ever was out into the Black Sea dodging Bosnia like a countess dodges a beggar on her way to the opera. I could end her with this sentence so that she no longer is. She would disappear, become a pale face in a prom photo, forgotten in an urban legend from high school, mentioned in some drunk moron's footnote where he boasts of all those he had before he settled down. She would be barely detectable in the little heap of earth we left there behind her house next to the cherry tree. I could kill her with a full stop. I choose to continue because I can. At least here I feel safe from her subtle violence. After a whole decade, I go back to my language, her language, and all the other languages I voluntarily abandoned, like one would a violent husband one afternoon in Dublin. After all these years, I'm not sure which language that is. And all that because of what? Because of the totally ordinary Leila Begich, in her old sneakers with straps and jeans with, for God's sakes, diamante on the butt. What happened between us? Does it matter? Good stories are never about what happens anyway. Pictures are all that's left. Like pavement paintings, years fall over them like rain. 
But our beginning was never a simple silent observer of chronology. Our beginning came and went several times, pulling on my sleeve like a hungry puppy. Let's go. Let's start again. We would constantly start and end. She would sneak into the fabric of the everyday like a virus. Enters Layla. Exits Layla. I can start anywhere, really. Dublin. St. Stephen's Green, for instance. The cell phone vibrating in my coat pocket. Unknown number. Then I press the damn button and say, yes, in a language not my own. Hello, you. I am gobsmacked by the writing. I really like the narrator. I have met Layla in two scenes. Well, the phone conversation that starts there and then in a flashback scene. I'm not going to say anything other than that I don't really like her. So I'm not sure about, I can't stand her and her subtle violence. I, so I'm not sure about that part of it. But boy, the writing is just fantastic. I can't believe that she could translate that into that idiom of English. It just is fantastic writing. So that's in progress too. Woo! Hey, well, it's 8.30 at night. I filmed this um, 10 hours ago. I haven't been editing for 10 hours. I think I'm a little bit played out or after all the excitement yesterday. I've had so many deep naps that it took me like an hour to wake up from the nap. And sometimes I couldn't fully wake up from the nap. So I had another nap. So it's the editing on this sucker has gone very slowly. I realized I left one out and then I realized how much left I was nattering on about. So I'm going to do the whole ending in five or six minutes or less instead of 15 or 20 more minutes because good lord if the f six of you that are still watching don't need to listen to me prattling on for that long. So the book that I forgot to mention was The Buddy Read with Britta. The Pain Tree by Olive Senior. Olive Senior is a Jamaican Canadian writer. This is her 2015 I believe yep 2015 collection of short stories we were a bit underwhelmed by the first story the title story we well I'll just talk about my reaction I felt it was really well written it had some really vivid moving aspects of it but it read more like a personal essay than a work of short fiction I was impressed but not wowed we'll keep going with that uh, Olive Senior is a mixed-race Jamaican-Canadian writer. She is divides her time between Jamaica and Toronto. It's my first anything by Olive Senior. So that is what I forgot. And now I'm going to give you a much more abbreviated version of what I'm planning to start. I am planning to start a lot. So I'm going to replace the audiobook I finished with, and I am going to give you a Reader's Digest condensed version of the of the stuff I rambled on about. I'm. It's it's a classic audiobook. It's The Way of All Fish by, what's his name? Samuel Butler. Oh, for Christ's sake. The Way of All Flesh. You've been eating too much sushi. He wrote it in the 1870s and 1880s. It's a satire of his pretentious British family that he didn't want published until after he was dead. So by the time he died, it didn't get published in 1903, but it's considered a Victorian novel. I'm doing it on audio, but I didn't like the free LibriVox version because it's narrated by an American woman. And I am very fussy about the accent. The accent of the audio narrator must match the story and other, I will not compromise on that. Any opinions? So. It, she sounded like a very competent, volunteer, amateur audiobook narrator on LibriVox for this particular novel, but no thank you. So I'm going to pay $25 to get the Apple Books audiobook with a very lovely male British narration. Anybody? What, what do you think? Am I going to like this novel? I didn't really... I researched a little bit, but it's not one that's ever been very high on my TBR list, but I thought, what the hell? I'm going to try it. I'll make this uh, short announcement now. I might do a full video later. I have never come right out and said it, but about five months ago, I quit Scribd in a rage. I will never go back, so I don't have access to free audiobooks because Scribd is shit. Um, so uh, I'm going to pay to get the audiobook for this uh, from, from Apple Books. For the booker, 
I am starting this one, which really intrigues me. Nadifa Mohammed's The Fortune Men, set in 1950s Cardiff, with a whole bunch of... She's a Somali-British writer, and the characters, this historical novel, they're, they're uh, East Indian, West Indian um, uh, sailors on the dock in Cardiff in 1952. It just sounds really different, and I'm going to start it this week. For Women in Translation and Invisible Cities, I'm going to be starting I'll Go On by Huang Zhong Un, translated from the Korean by Emily Ye Wan. And Ronan Hessian, this is one of his favorite novels from Korea. That uh, is pretty much all I need to know. I am looking forward to it. I'm certainly reading a lot from Tilted Axis Press this year, even this week. I'm declaring a moratorium on finishing two books and only starting one for the month of August because I just want to really get going with some booker reading and women in translation reading so that's going out the window and I'm even going to add one that I haven't made room for on my current reading um, because this came in the mail I kind of forgot that I ordered it didn't really research it too much when I bought it and here it is just in time for a women in translation month it is from Holland the Dandy by Nina Polak, and how about that cover image? Do you love it or do you hate it? Translated from the Dutch by Emma Rao, and it's a queer queer short stories. It's a chapbook, 28 pages, I think there's about six stories. I got a lot of extra reading time at the moment, so I'm going to fit this one in too, damn it! Can't wait to try it! And uh, just because read, and that is... Uh, I talked about it in reaction to some LitHub article, we don't have time to go into any of that here, but look at this. I a Touch of Jen by Beth Morgan. <laughs> Just love the cover image. I don't know why I love it, but I absolutely love it. And it is a girly novel about a, a young couple of insecure service workers, heterosexually coupled, that become obsessed with a former co-worker of the man's. And that is Jen. And plot ensues. I'll let you know how it goes. If I forgot anything in this much more condensed version of all what I was going on and on about, then you're just going to have to wait till next week. I hope you have a good week, and thanks for watching.